Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out, uh, either pre-spring break or pre uh, some final exam, uh, some midterm exam that you might have tomorrow. So we appreciate that you're here. My name is Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. Welcome to Ream Library. The McFarland Center's work includes sponsoring and supporting a range of lectures, conferences, discussions, and other programs on campus that foster dialogue around questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. In the last decade, we've also been especially committed to helping increase awareness of the realities of Catholicism as a truly global reality instantiated in diverse cultures. Our lecture today gives us an outstanding opportunity to think about those global realities and the networks and people who shaped Catholicism since the French Revolution. Today's lecture is part of the Deichmann Family Lectures on Religion and Modernity, and I'm grateful to John Deichmann of the class of 1970 and his family for making it possible. I'm really delighted to welcome a distinguished scholar, John McGreevy, to Holy Cross. I first met John when he was not long out of Stanford University, a young historian teaching at Harvard. I benefited enormously from his scholarship and kindness since then, and I've been really grateful for all that he's done as a leader in Catholic higher education. And it's been great to see him rise up so far since that terrible start at, at Harvard, starting so low. Uh, John is an accomplished scholar, administrator, and historian. He graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 1986 and returned there in 1997 after that stint as Dunwalk Associate Professor of American History at Harvard. And also after having published a really excellent first book, Parish Boundaries, The Catholic Encounter with Race in 20th Century Urban North. Just five years after his return to Notre Dame, he was appointed chair of the History Department. And about as many years after that, he was appointed Dean of Notre Dame's College of Liberal Arts and Letters. Today, in addition to his role as Francis A. McEnany Professor of History, he's the Charles and Jill Fisher Provost, the Chief Academic Officer, that is, of the University of Notre Dame. In addition to his impressive tenure as an administrator, John is a distinguished historian. He's received major fellowships and several awards for teaching and research. And in 2010, he served on the jury for the Pulitzer Prize in History. He's written four books that explore the history of the Catholic Church in the last 200 years, increasingly from a global perspective. The most recent of these, Catholicism, a global history from the French Revolution of Pope Francis, is what brings him back to Holy Cross today. It's a book that quite a number of us here at Holy Cross have read and appreciated. And if you paid attention to the Holy Cross magazine this time, you might have noticed when people asked, what is President Rougeau reading and benefiting from on that bottom, second page? Uh, right there, it mentioned this book as the one that he was reading at the time. I'm really grateful that John's here, that he's going to share something about that book with you. And please join me in welcoming John McGreevy. Thank you, Tom. Can everyone hear me? Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, should Catholics promote democracy? Before I answer that question, I want to thank my hosts, especially my old friend Tom Landy, uh, your provost, Elliot Visconsi, my former colleague, and your president, Vince Rougeau, also my former colleague. I'm honored to be back at Holy Cross, an institution I admire so much, and one that plays a vital role not just in this region and not just in the orbit of, of liberal arts colleges, but a vital role for Catholic higher education more generally. Now, to that end, I'm going to talk about the book that Tom generously referenced. I published a year ago on global Catholicism, a topic that I know Tom and others uh, have done much good work on global Catholicism at the McFarland Center. So before I answer the question, of whether Catholics should promote democracy, I'm going to ask you another question. Why did I write this book? Okay, it's 413 pages. Um, it was, it, I was thrilled to get a review in the New York Times, but the review said, oh my God, it's too long. You know, it was a positive review, but uh, it says too long. And so why write the book? Two reasons. The first was to make an argument. A better understanding of Catholicism enhances our grasp of the modern world. No institution is as multicultural or multilingual. Few touch as many people. The Chinese Communist Party, the European Union, the Central Intelligence Agency, the International Monetary Fund, all of these possess global influence. But only the Catholic Church includes extended networks of people and institutions 
in Warsaw, Nairobi, and Mexico City, as well as the most remote sections of the Amazon. Only Catholicism counts 1.2 billion baptized members, a majority of whom are people of color living in the global south. That is, a majority of Catholics do not look like me. They are people of color living in the global south. Only a pope, as Francis did when visiting Manila in 2015, can attract 6 million people, perhaps the largest crowd in human history, to attend Mass in a driving rainstorm. There's Francis in Manila in 2015. Historians increasingly recognize this, and the recent burst of superb scholarship on modern Catholicism what made my book possible. Placing these books and articles in conversation make visible similarities that are blurred when studying a single person, parish, town, or diocese. The biggest change in history writing, I'm a professional historian, the biggest change in history writing in my lifetime has been the loosening of the clamps of the nation state. Nation states matter for the study of modern Catholicism, and I try to suggest that in the book, but people, devotions, and ideas cross national borders with surprising ease. Now, the book is not comprehensive. Uh, the historian David Bell recently wrote that the scope of most global histories renders them incapable of assessing causation, or even, he said, sustaining a reader's interest. Suitably chastened, I've made this book as much as a story as I could. Every chapter begins with the story of one person. I'm going to tell some stories today, too. Uh, specialists will regret what is missing, and, and I understand why they do, but my goal with the book is to get as many people interested in the topic of global Catholicism as I can. So that's the first reason I wrote the book, to convey the importance of Catholicism as a global institution. The second reason I wrote the book is entirely personal. Most of my life, a bit to my amazement, Tom sketched out my, uh, the CV, has been spent studying in, teaching at, writing about, and administering Catholic institutions. On an almost daily basis, I get asked, and I wonder, how did we get here? The long sweep of the 19th century Catholic revival, the building of a vast protective milieu, including College of Holy Cross, of parishes, schools, and associations, the political crisis of the 1930s, World War II, decolonization, the Second Vatican Council, the end of the Cold War, and the sexual abuse crisis, these are the main episodes of the book. Cumulatively, this history from the French Revolution up until the current moment has resulted in a church marked by, on the one hand, unprecedented vibrancy in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia, concern for social justice everywhere, and global connections. A few years ago, I was attending Mass with my family at the most rural part of rural Minnesota you can imagine. We were on vacation there. And the priest in this tiny rural diocese uh, is from southern India. He handed out a typed copy of his homily so that his congregation, all of whom were descendants of Irish and German farmers who migrated to that region in the 19th century, could understand his, his accented English. If we could fly today to Guangzhou, China, and attend Mass in a 19th century church built by, of course, Chinese laborers, but designed by French Catholic immigrants, much like the French Catholic uh, priests who were designed churches all around the world. If we could go to that church right now, we would realize that a Sunday Mass at 12 o'clock, most of the congregation is Nigerian, Nigerians who've moved to Guangzhou to work in factories there. Meanwhile, in much of the world, including the United States, the number of observant Catholics is shrinking, even hemorrhaging. The structures built in the 19th and 20th century, that big section of Catholic history that, in my view, goes from the early 19th century up until the end of the Second Vatican Council, those structures are tottering. In 2020 in Ireland, which was once the source of missionary clergy and nuns for the, almost the entire Anglophone world, more bishops, two, were ordained than priests, one in all of Ireland. The sexual abuse crisis has taken an incalculable toll on survivors above all, but also on the credibility of Catholic institutions and the people who run them. The confidence of an earlier era. The West German magazine Der Spiegel in 1962 
explained to its readers that, quote, the Catholic Church has achieved a unity and consistency in teaching and structure never before seen. That confidence is a distant memory. So two reasons I wrote the book. First, to place Catholicism into global history, and second, to advance my own, and I hope more broadly Catholic, self-understanding. To get at those questions today, I'm going to go back to the question I began with and take one theme of the book, and that is the relationship between Catholicism and democracy. I think of that as a very pressing theme in this moment. So the question, should Catholics promote democracy? The answer did not seem obvious. Let's see. In, so one more. In 1941, and the guy in the middle there, whose name is Jacques Maritain, and if there's one hero in this book, it might be Jacques Maritain, was starting to ask the question in a new way in the 1930s and 1940s. I argue in the book that he's the most important Catholic intellectual of the 20th century. And in 1941, he was exiled from France. He had gotten out just before the Nazis conquered France. And he was actually living for a period of time in my hometown now of South Bend, Indiana. And he asked his friend Yves Simone, another faculty member, who a Catholic who had been exiled from France, who was on the Notre Dame faculty, could Simone run to the Notre Dame Library and confirm that Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century had believed that, quote, the consent of the people is required for the legitimacy of the state. Simone did run the library. He did get the citation for Maritain, but he did so bitterly. Both Simone and Maritain knew that Catholics around the world during the 1930s had become skeptical of democracy, many Catholics. In Austria, there was a Catholic prime minister who said, we don't need to have elections. In Portugal, Antonio Salazar, who became a kind of dictator, had once been a Catholic youth leader. In France itself, after the Germans occupied the country, a majority, probably, of Catholic intellectuals supported the Vichy government that was allied with Nazi Germany during World War II. To talk of Catholic democracy seemed to Simone, who's very bitter at this moment in 1941, only trash. The antagonism of Catholics to democracy, Maritain said, is the problem that we are asked to overcome. Now, we're living in a democratic crisis right now, and that's prompting a scholarly outpouring. And scholars are looking at uh, times and places where democracies reverted to dictatorships, as in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s, and South America in the 1970s. The most famous book of this type is called How Democracies Die. I recommend it to any of you, if you maybe have encountered it in a class. It's written by two Harvard political scientists. And they try and take up some of the questions that Maritain and Simone raised in the late 1930s and early 1940s. They note how a hierarchical Catholicism in the 1930s existed uneasily with democratic politics. Now, some Catholic leaders in the 1930s, notably in Belgium, actively resisted authoritarianism. But others, as I just said, in Austria, in Portugal, in Argentina, in Brazil, welcomed it. That's the 1930s. Let's step back a second into the early 19th century, just after the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution was, in some ways, the first democratic revolution, the establishment of consent of the government and democratic institutions, but in its later stages it was deeply anti-Catholic. And for that reason, many Catholics opposed, at least in theory, the idea of democracy when they thought about the French Revolution. The reality, though, was if you take a wider global view, which I try to do in the book, and you look at Latin America and Spain and parts of Italy, which became more democratic for Catholic purposes in the 19th century, you get a different perspective. Latin America is the most democratic region in the world in 1830. You don't really count the United States because enslaved people were not allowed to vote uh, in 1830. And bishops and priests in Latin America and Spain encouraged this democratization. When Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States in 1831, very famously, he said Catholics are the most democratic class in the United States. He thought Catholics were predisposed because of the equality of all believers within the church to favor democratic and republican government. In fact, he said, don't worry 
about the French Revolution, which in its way was anti-Catholic. In reality, the Catholic religion is the natural friend of democracy. Now, some of these same Catholics who are advocating for democracy in Latin America and in Spain and a little bit in the United States and in Canada, they were also advocating for democracy within the church. They were saying, should we have more voice within church affairs? Could we um, control or have a voice in the appointments of bishops and the appointments of parish priests? These advocates were almost always male. They were lay. They were elite. But they were taking the ideas learned in the political realm and translating them into the religious realm. This translation collapses in the 1840s. A nascent alliance between Catholicism and democracy diminishes. And in fact, Pius IX, who's the Pope who was elected from 1846 to 1878, retreats in a very defensive way against democracy after the revolutions, of the, of the revolutions that occur in 1848. He stresses the need to defend church property against liberal governments who are, in fact, quite willing to expel priests and nuns or to seize church property. After all, in Worcester, I might add, it's a liberal government in Massachusetts in the 1850s, anti-slavery liberal government that is also deeply anti-Catholic and suspicious of a hierarchical Catholicism. So for that reason, many Catholics are resisting uh, this move to democracy by the late 19th century. Now, to be fair, Catholics in much of Europe and South America do form political parties in the late 19th century in a somewhat defensive way. They, as, as mass suffrage expands around the world, they form political parties to contest for Catholic positions. The German Center Party, or Zentrum, was the most famous of these. It was led by a guy named Ludwig Vinthorst. If you open an atlas, you can see a town named for Vinthorst in Texas and a town named for Vinthorst in Saskatchewan as German Catholic migrants who admired Vinthorst are migrating from Germany to both uh, Canada and the United States. In Anglophone countries, especially Irish Catholics, adapt very quickly to democratic regimes. And so in the United States, in 1928, Al Smith is the nominee of the Democratic Party. He's a Catholic. Uh, in 1929, he's the child of Irish immigrants. In 1929, the child of Australian Irish immigrants, becomes Prime Minister of Australia. But Catholic theory lagged Catholic practice. When challenged to defend Leo XIII's encyclical of the 1880s, which advocates for a unity of church and state, Al Smith famously responded, what the hell is an encyclical? Uh, he had no idea. He had no idea of what the discussions were about Catholicism and democracy. And in fact, as I said, the more dominant pattern, pattern was for one-time democracies in Europe and South America to become authoritarian governments during the crisis of the 1920s and 1930s. This photo here is of the famous um, statue. Did I fall down here? Can you still hear me? Yeah. No. Okay. Might need. Uh, no, no, no. No. Let's try this again, sir. Get her going. Thank you. Just like that. There we go. All right. Okay. Let's try that instead. All right. Good. Yeah. Okay. This statue, famous statue over Rio de Janeiro's harbor, Christ the Redeemer. Uh, all the people you can almost see there are bishops and politicians. The entire cabinet is there, the president is there, all the bishops of the country are there to dedicate this statue of Christ the Redeemer over the Rio de Janeiro harbor, and they are all just about to endorse the transition of Brazil from a democratic to an authoritarian regime uh, in the mid-1930s. And there's a real alliance between Catholics and, and leading politicians that democracy is the political system of the past, not the political system of the future. Kind of famously, uh, in 1934, the Vatican negotiates a treaty with Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler has just been elected. This is uh, the leading German and Vatican diplomats who are negotiating that treaty in this photo. The Vatican diplomats did that to protect Catholic institutions from Nazi Germany. But the criticism of Nazi Germany they made was that Nazi, the Nazis were threatening and indeed did take over almost all independent Catholic institutions. The criticism was not that the Nazis were anti-democratic. 
You even see it in this photo. Anyone know who this is? Trivia question. No? Yes? Franco. Franco, okay. Great. Uh, Francisco Franco is on the left there in the kind of pointed hat. Uh, that's the Archbishop of Toledo in Spain, who's two people over from him. Again, Franco is the winner in the Spanish Civil War of the late 1930s. Spain's Democrat government has by now collapsed. Franco becomes a dictator with the tacit admiration, and sometimes not just tacit admiration, uh, of many of the Catholic bishops. Democracy was the dog that did not bark in Catholic social thought. Pius XI authored a condescending appraisal of modern democratic states, which are most exposed to the danger of being overthrown by one faction or another. All of this was the world that Jacques Maritain wanted to change. He was an unlikely reformer. Early in his career, he had seen no merit to democracy. In fact, he thought monarchism in the early 20th century was the best form of government. But he eventually shifted gears. His Masterpiece is a 1936 book called Integral Humanism. I will say it's a bit of an unreadable masterpiece when translated from Maritain's meandering French, but nonetheless one of the crucial political texts of the 20th century. Maritain outlined a Catholic and democratic vision. He argued that the human person could only flourish when embedded in communities such as the family, professions, and churches. But the human person needed to be embedded in a political community as well. Democratic governments with universal suffrage for women as well as for men followed from a distinction Maritain made between religious and political authority. And indeed, he started to argue by the late 1930s that the gospel required democratic governments, that the gospel led to Catholics supporting those institutions. He promoted this version of democratic personalism through ceaseless writing and traveling. He, in the period of three years, he went to Germany, Canada, Poland, Argentina, Spain, the United States, and basically every country uh, in Western Europe, promoting the idea that Catholics should, purport, should support democracy in this moment of political crisis. When he went to Italy, uh, he thrilled a generation of Catholic intellectuals who were disenchanted by this time with Mussolini, including the uh, the young Paul the man, uh, Giovanni Mattini, who becomes Pope Paul VI. When he goes to Rio de Janeiro and when he goes to uh, Brazil, he draws huge crowds for his lectures. When he comes to the United States during the war, when he gets to the, war, the United States after fleeing France, this only deepens his convictions. In 1942, he drafts a statement, a manifesto by European Catholics sojourning in America. And in that statement, it's called In the Face of the World's Crisis, uh, he argues that the real issue at stake is the need for Catholics to support democracies. In fact, he says, Thomas Aquinas, this is not potentially true to those of you who are deeply studying the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas was a Democrat in this sense, that the gospel works in history in a democratic direction. And in the context of the war, Maritain's views started to change minds. Pius XII famously makes an announcement in Christmas of 1944. This is a copy of that message in which he does say, with many caveats, uh, and this is new, that maybe democracy is and should be the dominant form of political government. Because of Maritain, because of this agitation for democracy as a Catholic form of government, things start to change quite dramatically after World War II. Maritain's ideas underwrote one of the key achievements of 20th century political thought, or political history, I should say, Christian Democratic parties. You don't know any of these three people here, but on the left is, um, well, in the, in, is Robert Schumann from France. In the middle is Conrad Adenauer from Germany. On the right is a man named Elsie de, de Gasperi from Italy. All became either prime minister or president. All were Catholic. All read Maritain closely and all founded Christian democratic political parties in the years immediately following World War II. And in fact, Christian democracy becomes popular around the world. There are Christian de democratic political parties, not in the United States, obviously, but in Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, Brazil, Chile, Venezuela, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. And during most of the period from 1945 to 1980, 
Christian democratic parties are in power as democracy expands around the world. Now, not only Catholics belonged to Christian democratic parties, but they, and they were never controlled by the institutional church, but the lineage is very direct. By 1960, the list of Catholic presidents and prime ministers who claim to have been influenced by Maritain is striking, and I mentioned a few of them, Adnauer, uh, De Gasperi, Robert Schumann, all of whom are in that photo, but it also includes Charles de Gaulle, Leopold Senghar from Senegal. It includes this man who was the president of South Vietnam, No Dien Diem. It includes this man shaking hands with John Kennedy. His name is Benedicto Kiwanuka, and he founded the Christian Democratic Party in Uganda. It did not include John Kennedy, uh, who's in this photo, whose intellectual formation was innocent of Catholic social thought, but it did include his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, the first director of the Peace Corps on, and the War on Poverty. It even included, we are told, Joseph R. Biden Sr., father of a future U.S. president. Now, our President Biden has a penchant for loosely documented stories about his father, so maybe it's not true, as he told David Brooks, that his working class father read Maritan in the 1950s. But even if it weren't true, the very fact of President Biden's misremembering, his association of Catholic liberalism with Maritan is significant. At the Second Vatican Council, in terms of Catholic advocacy for democracy, Maritan's ideas triumph. His old friend, Giovanni Mattini, is now Paul VI. Uh, and at the council, in the last document, Gaudium et Fez, there are a couple paragraphs which sketch the importance of all citizens, in quotes, taking part in public affairs, in quotes. The impact of Gaudium et Fez was immense. If in the 1950s intellectuals wondered, given our experience in the 1920s and 1930s, can Catholics really support democracy? Or are they too hierarchical? Are they too suspicious of popular authority? That was the view in the 1950s. By the 1980s, political scientists are writing about the capacity of Catholics to inspire democracies. And so you can see that around the world. Uh, two historians at Creighton have recently told the story of the man in this photo, Benedictive Kiwanuka. It's a tragic story. Kiwanuka founded the Christian Democratic Party in Uganda, as, you, as I just mentioned. He worked, he's, becomes the Supreme Court Chief Justice in Uganda, but then Idi Amin takes over and eventually uh, persecutes all outsiders, including primarily Asians, but also Catholic priests, and expels them from Uganda. And eventually orders, and in fact, some people think he did the deed himself, Kiwanuka's murder, because Kiwanuka continues to advocate for democracy even under uh, Idi Amin's dictatorship. We have a happier story in the Philippines, where here are two nuns during the People Power Revolution of the 1980s, uh, where the dictator... Um, uh, Ferdinand Marcos is eventually removed from power in which the Catholic Church uh, in all dimensions from the Catholic radio station to Catholic agitation on the street to Catholic schools and Catholic universities was the crucial actor inspired by Maritain, inspired by the Second Vatican Council uh, in moving that country toward democracy. You could tell a similar story about South Korea where Catholic activists are only about 10% of the population, Catholics are about 10% of the population, but nonetheless are crucial actors in the movement from dictatorship to democracy in South Korea in the 1980s. And probably you could tell the most dramatic story uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, here's John Paul II during his very famous first visit to Poland as Pope in 1979. John Paul did not himself cause the collapse of communism in Eastern and Central Europe, but he played a significant role. Uh, a year after this visit, the Solidarity Union is formed and in the Solidarity Manifesto, there are several quotations from John Paul II's writings on labor and on the importance of democracy uh, in, in all political societies. And in fact, uh, the, there was lots of interplay between Solidarity, which becomes the main vehicle for protest against the Polish Communist government, and John Paul II himself. So an extraordinary set of occurrences in those first two decades after the Second Vatican Council. Catholics are seen to be leading the charge for democracy when, in fact, a generation earlier, people had wondered if Catholics could support democracy. An extraordinary global history. These triumphs, I must say, viewed 40 years later, seem as if from a different world. There are still isolated, inspiring figures. I think of 
Martin Lee and Jimmy Lai in Hong Kong, who have both been imprisoned by the Chinese Communist Party, who are both um, Catholics and, and, and say that their work for democracy comes out of Catholic auspices. That's still there, but more dominantly, uh, the link between Catholicism and democracy seems frayed. In the heavily Catholic Philippines, a dictator, Rodrigo Duarte, ran Russia toward the Constitution. In Europe and South America, Christian democratic parties are in eclipse. They're no longer as powerful as they once were. And in the United States, we are living through the most significant political and democratic crisis since the 19th century. A majority of Republican Party candidates elected to the United States House of Representatives in 2022 denied the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election. Some of them are Catholic. One prominent Catholic representative from Arizona, Paul Gosar, peddles the false narrative of election um, fraud at every opportunity. And I would say within the United States and maybe even more broadly, the Catholic response to the democratic crisis from bishops certainly, but even more broadly than that, has been muted. We have, in a sense, forgotten what Maritain taught us. Denver Archbishop Samuel Aquila, writing about abortion, complains about Catholics overly concerned with democracy, civility, and engagement. The, the terms are his. Nothing could be further from Maritain's intense commitment to democratic practice in the late 1930s and 1940s. At the height of the drama of World War II, Maritain <laughs> took a couple weeks, if you go through his papers, it's kind of amazing, and he wrote an essay on Machiavelli. You might think, why is he doing this? Well, he wanted to make the point that he disagreed with the idea of politics as Machiavellian. In fact, politics is a noble vocation, he said. We need more good people to go into politics. Now, what does this mean for the church? In the 19th century, I said, ideas about democracy within the political realm segued into ideas about democracy in the religious realm. And we see some of that now, I think. Uh, on the negative side, some of the same figures trampling on democratic norms in the public arena oppose the efforts of Pope Francis to reconsider representation within the church. Stephen Bannon uses his podcast to at once, and he can do this in the same episode, promote conspiracy theories about the 2020 election and promote conspiracy theories in opposition to Pope Francis. More positively, Francis, who has been vigorous in his defense of democracy as a political system, has also made synods central to his papacy, picking up a thread left dangling by Pope Paul VI. In the early 19th century, Catholic reformers who were involved in drafting some of the first, world's first constitutions took, as I said, ideas about representation and voice from politics into religion. Now I sometimes wonder if it might go the other way. National synods are, have been completed in Germany and Australia, and the Germans in particular are building on a tradition of clergy, nuns, lay people, and bishops gathering for discussion. In the United States, just less than a million Catholics participated last year in the synod. You might say, that's a tiny percentage of the country's Catholics, and you would be right. But it's a million more people who entered a room and talked about their hopes for the church and for the wider society than ever before. As you know, a massive synod was convened in Rome in the fall of 2023 and will be again in the fall of 2024. Francis believes that contemporary Catholics can develop new mechanisms for discussing the problems and opportunities that confront them. Again, he's been vocal in his defense of democracy around the world, including a memorable speech in the birthplace of democracy, Athens. We could use more movement from the religious realm to the political realm now. Maritain considered writing an updated version of the Federalist Papers in 1941 applicable to the entire world. And Catholics too, then and now, should be thinking about how to repair fractures within church and nation. Pope Francis says we do not live in an era of change. We do not live in an era of change, but we live in a change of era. Not an era of change, but a change of era. The ground beneath political, diplomatic, ecological, and ecclesiastical certainties is shifting. Certainly within the church this is true. I haven't talked this afternoon about other core themes of the book, including the shift of gravity in Catholicism from the global north to the global south. Um, Nigeria this Sunday will have as many Catholics in mass as all of Western Europe. I haven't talked in any detail about the sexual abuse crisis, 
which I treat in the book as an organic development of church structures. I haven't talked about changing forms of piety and spirituality. My point, though, is this. Catholicism as an institution will be reinvented in the 21st century, much as it was in the 19th, and much as it was again in the middle of the 20th century, and part of that reinvention was a closer attention to democracy as political practice. We don't know how it will be reinvented in the years ahead, and my hope is that this book, and perhaps this talk, provides a savvy baseline as the process of transformation unfolds. If it does that, it will certainly have served its purpose. Okay, I'll do one other thing. There's Francis in the Senate, and here's the best photo of all. This is two weeks ago. Me shamelessly handing my book to the Pope. <laughs> and here was the encounter. I was in front of the Pope for about 28 seconds. I nervously hand him the book with my right hand. He accepts it. He's looking at it. You see in the title it says, you know, Catholicism, a global history from the French Revolution to Pope Francis. He's looking at it and he's reading it. And he had just given an address to the, this was a large group uh, in Italian. And he looks at it and he says to me in English, thank you, very slowly, and then just hands it to an aide and I walk away. So that was my encounter. <laughs> Listen, you've been a very patient audience. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you for the speech. I really enjoyed it. But I have a quick un un question about uh, your discussion about the Spanish Civil War when the Catholic Church tried to promote democracy in Spain and uh, cooperate with Franco, kind of, or negotiate with Franco. But I have a quick question. During the Civil War, the Spanish Catholic Church actually cooperated with uh, Franco instead of fighting against him, so how could you understand that? Or do you think it's a Catholic Church way to investigate democracy or something? No, I, I agree with you. You're yeah. right. During the Spanish, I, I, if, I, if I misspoke, I apologize. During the Spanish Civil War, the Spanish Catholic Church broadly, not all Spanish Catholics, are allied with Franco. And remember, to be fair, uh, the, so there's two sides in the Spanish Civil War, the Loyalist and the Republican side. The Republican side is Franco. It's not democratic. It's very associated with a kind of populist right-wing Catholicism. There's another side called the Loyalist side, much less Catholic. The Loyalist side was, in fact, anti-Catholic. Uh, destroyed hundreds of search churches, murdered many uh, priests and nuns. There's some complications to that about Basque Catholics I could get into. But broadly, uh, Catholicism was not on the side of democracy in the Spanish Civil War. And Maritain, who I talked about, becomes famous in a way. I mean, he was well known within scholarly circles by very vigorously saying, Franco's cause is not a Catholic cause. Catholics should be supporting democracy, and whatever bad things the anti-Catholic forces in Spain have done, it doesn't justify supporting Franco. That was a very controversial position within the Catholic world of the late 1930s, uh, which was a very polarized world. But that's what he's trying to do. Does that make sense oh, to yes, you? Oh, making sense. Thank yeah, you for the, yeah. thank you, sorry for the misunderstanding, but. No, no, I, well, I, I, it was probably my mistake. I apologize. But okay, yes, you. very much Franco is an example for Maritain of the wrong way for Catholics to think about politics. To think about, he would say, Maritain would have said, don't think about politics as just protecting the church. Don't think about politics where Democracy is sort of a side note. Uh, what's really important is having Catholic schools and Catholic institutions. Instead, we, those are important, but we have to think about it differently. And the Spanish Civil War is a pivotal moment. Okay. John, thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, so I take this in some ways as a call to action yeah. for Catholics to rec reclaim um, commitments to democracy yeah. that maybe have been, in your words, muted. Um, there might be stronger ways of describing yeah. the lack of a reaction um, than muted, but that's, yeah. that's another story. Um, I wonder to what degree you think that, um, that the mantle of leadership, whether in the United States or in the Global South, but especially in the United States for our local context, um, might fall to institutions of Catholic higher education. So are there ways in which colleges and universities yeah. can pick up the baton, as yeah. you've described it, and to not only advocate for 
um, but also model um, democracy? Yeah. It's such a great question. Uh, the, by the way, you all students know this is your provost, Elliot Visconti, who is my uh, former and much missed colleague uh, at, at Notre Dame. Well, we should give him a round of applause because we really miss him at Notre Dame. He's a really great colleague there. Um, that's such a good question. You're right, Muta is probably charitable. I think we should view sustaining, protecting, nurturing democracy as a key component of Catholic social thought. I think it's as, I don't want to try and rank things, but what have been Pope Francis's great issues uh, in his papacy? They've probably been two. One is the environment, of course, I, I'm very supportive of that, and one is migration. Very controversial in, in the American context, by the way. In a way, I think it would be good to say there's a third. I don't think he's talked about it as much. I don't think it's as important as it is to, to him, but it should be democracy. The preserv preservation, sustenance, nurturing of genuine, open democracy. We need much more activism around this question uh, and, and the capacity and ability to see that as central uh, to Catholic social thought. I, I, I believe that very strongly. I will say at my own university, we're trying to start a big democracy initiative in part for that, we're not the only ones, and there are lots of secular universities doing that too, uh, but it's in part for that reason. It's very important to not move back on all the progress that was made from the crucible of the 1930s and early 1940s, when that was an open question within Catholic thought. And it's not so much that it's an open question now, but we seem to be um, more sleepwalking toward uh, you know, potentially grave consequences in our own country uh, in the next year, but, but certainly also around the world where many countries seem to be sliding away from authentic democracy to something closer to authoritarian government. And we are in the midst of a global democratic crisis a bit like the 1930s, and we're going to need a comparable response. So I know Elliot asked about colleges and universities, yeah. but if I think of Maritan or some of the figures, what I loved about your book was that you talked about these transnational networks that brought people together yeah. and brought ideas. And one of the things that worries me is that uh, that was a kind of uh, thick institutional world within the church. So yeah. I would look at Mar Maritain didn't come from nowhere. He had yeah. all of these networks of support and people know here's the organizer in me, right? But yeah. um, how optimistic are you in terms of what's left, who's left in terms of these networks or how do we build the yeah. kinds of social networks and conversations that enable whoever the next Maritain, whoever yeah, the others yeah. are? Such a good question. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not so pessimistic, actually, because uh, if you thought about what well, Maritain was really resting, I know he was a great, he was a big figure generally. You know, the United Nations called on him to be more than any other single person, the person who drafted the Declaration on Human Rights in 1948. So he was a sort of giant figure out, even outside somewhat the Catholic circles. But in the Catholic circles, you're right, he was a championship networker and his correspondence, I mean, the poor person, we need a great Maritain biography if any of you students out there are, are up for that, but it will be challenging because he wrote like 30, 40 letters a day, most of which have been preserved. And so his correspondence is vast and it is genuinely global. It's also multilingual. And, but in a way, we still have a lot of those institutions, especially in the global south, where Catholic institutions are growing pretty rapidly and in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and the Philippines and other places. And it'll just require more imagination, more willingness, I think of the Jesuit networks, um, to try and develop those ties, uh, not in some kind of forced collaboration, but in some ways to leverage the capacities that maybe we have, especially in the global north, but also to leverage those around the world. We're entering not just an era of democratic deficit, I think, uh, around the world, but an era of heightened nationalism and, and, and almost a retreating sense uh, among many countries. And I guess I'd like to think Catholicism as the most multicultural, multilingual institution in the world, and I think Francis does believe this, can be a bit of a counterweight to that. We need desperately in this world right now successful global institutions. It is an absolute desperate crying need and you'd like to think Catholicism could do even more. 
John, thanks so thanks. much for a wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm wondering if I can ask you to, to connect this work with your very excellent work on, this, on the history of the Jesuits. Yeah. Um, so you know uh, better than anybody in this room, including me, the, the ways in which the Jesuits that come to the United States are in some senses refugees from yeah. democratic yeah. countries uh, and tend to have in certain places, including people who start institutions maybe like this one, yeah. uh, a certain anti-democratic flavor to them. Um, and so thinking about historically the factors which are pushing people to the positions that they hold, right? Yeah. The Jesuits there are reacting against the experience yeah. of being pushed out. Uh, and the church, which is moving, if I understand you correctly, from a kind of robust global support of democracy into some kind of slouch yeah. in yeah. that respect. Yeah. So what are the factors that you think are pushing the church toward the slouch, maybe is my question. If the Je for the Jesuits, it was yeah. they had been pushed out by democratic institutions. What's favoring slouch in terms of democracy? So I, 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 I'm going to give you a slightly controversial answer to that, and I don't have a I haven't thought this through myself, so this is provisional. But if the question is, well, why hasn't there been within the U.S. Church, Catholic colleges, everything else, uh, and maybe even U.S. society, a more vigorous response? to what seem to me now pretty clear threats uh, to democracy. We don't know how it's going to turn out. It might not, might not come to fruition. But there are threats to basic democratic practice. We have a candidate for president you know, who at least threatens uh, to do things that are deeply anti-democratic. We had a revolt on January 6th that was unprecedented in American history. We see a lot of what political scientists call norm trampling uh, around the way the parties interact, the way Supreme Court appointments are done, a whole range of things that make the system seem much more fragile. Okay, why hasn't then there been a bigger response within Catholicism and then maybe outside? Within Catholicism, I think it's hard to tell the story without telling a story about abortion. And the centrality of abortion to Catholic social thought in the last generation and how that in some ways was democratic, right? The Catholic argument uh, against Roe versus Wade was often let's re return things to the state, not have an undemocratic Supreme Court make these decisions. But in some ways, I think has evolved in an anti-democratic direction too, that if the abortion question were resolved, we, then we, that's what we have to worry about most. We don't have to worry about anything else. Let's really worry about that particular question. A lot more I could say about that. I haven't sorted it through in my own mind. I don't think you can tell the story of the rather weak response within Catholicism to this democratic crisis without thinking about the centrality of the abortion issue over the last generation. More broadly, that's an interesting question. Why hasn't there, you know, beyond Catholic circles, I'm of the view, Levitsky and Ziblatt, who I quoted, these Harvard political scientists say this too, it's not new with me, boy, social media and changing media technology has been crucial. The inability to agree on a set of facts, the inability for people who are listening to one sets of TV programs and news programs, to talk to people who are listening to another set of TV programs and news programs. That's not just a function of polarization, it's a cause of polarization. So that's huge. Um, and I could go on, you know, and a lot of those things would be familiar to you, but we're in a situation of such deep polarization that, again, I think the democracy is at a greater risk than really since the mid-19th century. You said you're not entirely pessimistic. There's been some attention in the last few weeks in the media in this country about whether or not there is a Catholic vote de facto. I wonder if you could comment on the prospects of something like the American Solidarity Party and yeah. movements like this. I don't know enough about the American Solidarity Party, uh, which is a political party formed, there are a lot of Catholics involved in the formation of that political party that's kind of pro-life on one end and very pro-union and pro-labor on another end. Um, but your, I mean, your question makes me more pessimistic in the sense that, you know, I mean, the idea of them triumphing seems kind of inconceivable in our political universe. Um, and, and, and the way the political parties are organized now, the way the structures are organized now, works so deeply against any new political effort of that type, it's hard to see it emerging. Uh, so in, uh, where I become more optimistic is there are lots of great people out there in both political parties. There's lots of energy around trying to think about new forms of media. There's lots of work to try and, I think even in universities and colleges like Holy Cross, to try and bring people 
together from different political viewpoints and have honest, candid exchanges, something we've become less good at as a country uh, in the last generation. So there's lots of good efforts going on. That's where I become more optimistic. Um, if the American Solidarity Party starts to win a few elections or, or get close, that, that'd be a different story. But they seem, and it's very difficult to start third parties, as they seem just mired in the below 1% uh, of uh, vote totals in any even local election. Thanks again. Yeah. Um, and you know, as you as we think about this, uh, what gives you the most hope when you think about <laughs> the dynamics we're facing now and so much of how yeah. Catholic attitudes have been shaped in in really the last tw twenty years, as you've talked about it? Yeah. Are there is there a particular strand you look to, and you look to the current generation and I mean, say, take the, the mantle and run with it? Some of the hope is in there, in that. If you would have said in 1940 that Catholics would be the prime movers behind democratic revolutions in at least four or five countries around the world a generation later, or 30 years later, no one would have believed you. No one. If there was a dominant Catholic impulse in the late 1930s, it was a kind of soft authoritarianism and a kind of skepticism of democracies, because democracies often were anti-Catholic, and you didn't know the outcomes of debates in democracies, and there were some real problems with democracies, and there were. It's not a perfect system of government. If you had said that in 1938, no one would have believed that in South Korea, in Poland, in Spain, where the transition from Franco is very much assisted by the Spanish Catholic bishops to a democratic system. Uh, I mentioned South Korea, Poland, uh, well, Philippines. Uh, in all those countries, um, uh, in, in Latin America, there are authoritarian regimes, and Catholics are crucial to overthrowing those authoritarian regimes in Brazil, for example, uh, in the 1980s. So there are many positive stories that came out of a lot of hard work by people who were in the minority and were going uphill. Uh, that's what gives me hope, that things looked bleak 70 years ago, uh, much bleaker than they are right now, in fact, and yet there were tremendous outcomes. And so that's, I, I think that's something very much to hold on to. Oh, well, first, thank you, John. Thank it's you. so good to see you again. Um, uh, so my question actually kind of relates back to your earlier book, Catholicism and American Freedom. Yeah. And I was, I was drawn to your comments about Maritain and his concepts of integral humanism yeah. as a kind of foundation, you know, seeing the human self as fundamentally embedded yep. in community. Did Maritain see, see himself in many ways in, in striking a more robust, kind of creating a more robust foundation for democracy than yep. that kind of created in, you know, the kind of, dare say, you know, Protestant individualistic yep. kind of understanding of democracy? And would he argue maybe looking at it today that these individualistic foundations for democracy kind of collapsed under their own weight? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean. I think it's a it's, great question, Justin. And. Uh, Maritain would have been a fan of Robert Putnam. Some of you have heard of Robert Putnam, the famous Harvard political scientist who wrote a book called Bowling Alone and said that Americans have become, Americans used to be called a nation of joiners and people who built lots of different civic and community organizations. And Putnam argues kind of famously that has declined. Maritain would say, and exactly right. Uh, his view of politics was uh, it should come organically from families and civic organizations and community organizations. And he was a big believer, by the way, in community organizing. You know, how can you, you know, Saul Alinsky style community organizing? Maritain thought that was fantastic. Um, and politics, broadly conceived, should come organically out of that. It shouldn't just be national political parties who raise money from big donors, hypothetically, uh, and without much local activism. Now, there might be, that might be called naive or, 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 or maybe implausible in the current moment, but that was very much his vision of politics, that it came organically out of community. The reason, he thought, democracies in Europe and South America had collapsed in the 1920s and 1930s was that democracy had become too much a thing of the elites, and it had not built out of these structures of family, community, churches, et cetera. Um, I, I, so I think there's some resonance between what Maritain was saying then and Mar what Maritain was saying, or what Robert Putnam is saying now. Uh, Maritain himself was a terrible political party, I should say. I mean, he, no political party was ever good enough for him. Um, so even the Christian Democratic parties who are all saying, I draw my, you know, we draw our inspiration from Maritain, 
Maritime would always say, but I don't like plank four of your platform. So he didn't really practice what he preached. We need to acknowledge that. Um, but what he preached was very influential and it, and it struck the right chord at the right moment. Great. I think we're, I think I've exhausted you. Thank you so much for your, your patient attendance.